to the Conscious Style Podcast, where we explore what it will take to build a better, more sustainable, and equitable future for fashion. I'm your host, Elizabeth Joy. Now let's dive into today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of the Conscious Style Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking all about the secondhand fashion ecosystem with guest Emily Stokel, the producer and host of Pre-Loved Podcast, a weekly interview show that explores all things vintage, thrift, and secondhand. I'm going to be chatting with Emily in this episode about what pre-loved fashion encompasses and how you can get started not only with shopping secondhand thoughtfully, but with secondhand fashion activism as well. We also are talking in detail about the concern of the gentrification of thrift stores and what this conversation might be missing. And I also had to ask Emily about her thoughts on the recent news of secondhand fashion retailer ThreadUp being valued at over a billion US dollars and traded on the stock market and what she thinks that this means for the future of secondhand. Finally, Emily is going to be sharing some fantastic insights into how charity shops operate and what this means for the global secondhand trade. So we clearly have a lot of ground to cover and we will get right to the episode in just a moment. First though, I wanted to remind you to subscribe or follow the Conscious Style podcast on your favorite podcast app so that you do not miss any future conversations like this one. And if you are enjoying the podcast so far, it would mean so much if you could take a moment to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, as this will help the content reach more people and help me continue producing this show. Thank you in advance. All right, now let's get into this conversation with Emily. Emily is going to start us off here with her story and how she got into secondhand fashion. I'm Emily Stokel. I'm the host and creator of Preloved Podcast, and I create content around vintage, secondhand, climate activism, garment worker solidarity, and sustainability over on my Instagram, which is at Emily M. Stokel. But actually, like the way that I got into this space, you know, the sustainability journey actually for me started with labor activism. I really believe that social sustainability or the ethical side of the industry is just as important, like the people side is just as important as the climate side of this story. But basically, my grandma, who was really involved in my upbringing, was a labor activist. She worked in a factory. She built carburetors and she was you know, a single mom of six kids and life was really hard for her. But you know, one privilege that she did have was that she had a union job. And so even though she did participate in a lot of walkouts or strikes, you know, she was able to provide for her family. So she kind of raised me with understanding that importance of like a good union job, right? And of course, that's few and far between in the U.S. today. And and I often think about what would my grandma's story have been like as a single mom raising six kids in 2020? And, you know, if if she were my age in my shoes at that time, kind of what her life would have been like and how much harder it could have been. So anyway, worker solidarity has always been really important to me. I started thrifting in high school and college the way that a lot of people do, you know, just because it's fun and cheap, you know, a cheap way to buy new clothes when you're falling on a budget with your babysitting money or whatever. And didn't think much more of it. Didn't really think about how it like connected to my values or anything like that. But around 2013, you know, when the Rana Plaza factory collapse happened and then shortly after the True Cost documentary came out, and it was then that I started to realize that like the fashion industry was a worker rights issue that there are people being really mistreated within this industry and that so many of us are complicit in it. And at that point, that I, I would say that that was like my quitting fast fashion moment, although I was already really into thrifting, so it wasn't you know a particularly dramatic shift for me. I just decided that it was going to be secondhand for me you know, that was what I was going to do. Then I kind of got deeper and deeper into this space. I started to learn more about it as you do, as you get passionate about a topic. And 
I started to realize that like within the world of sustainable and ethical fashion at the time, you know, this is several years ago now, there wasn't like as much conversation around like the secondhand side of things. And that was what I was really passionate about. There wasn't, you know, there were so many incredible resources starting to come out about the fashion industry and its issues. And there wasn't something that like specifically focused on secondhand at that time. And so I decided that I would make the podcast I want to see, I guess, and started interviewing folks about their work in the secondhand industry. And it's been three years of doing so. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story and background. So you're quite experienced in the secondhand fashion space. So could you give a little bit of a definition or give some context into what secondhand fashion exactly is and what it encompasses for those maybe newer to the term and to the space? For sure. So I came to use the word pre-loved because I feel like that encompasses any clothes that had a life before me. So you know, vintage clothes, that's like technically defined as clothes that are 20 plus years old. Thrifted, like that's, you know, people think of that as like clothes you get at a discount price from a thrift store. But then there's like secondhand shops, there's buy, sell, trade shops. Even the things we say are secondhand, like they could be third hand, fourth hand, who knows how many people have given those clothes life before. Clothes can even be swapped or rented, you know, so on and so on. For me, it's like I like to prioritize things that aren't new. So uh, anything that had a life before me, any way that I can avoid new production is really what my aim is. Yeah, I really like that term pre-loved as well because it is more general and I think sounds cooler as well. (laughs) It's like fun, right? Like it's like, I don't know, secondhand. It's fine, but it's like less good maybe. I don't know. Like it's not new. Whereas pre-loved, it's like, ooh, someone else loved this too. Right. And it puts this emphasis on building a relationship with our clothes and our wardrobe, which is such Mm -hmm. a crucial part of slowing down fashion and creating a more sustainable fashion system. So I really, I really love that. So what advice do you have for a person who is just getting started out with pre-loved fashion? Yeah, so honestly, my best tip for folks who are just getting into it, you know, maybe they're overwhelmed of going into a big thrift shop or there's not a great thrift shop in their area, you know, or of course, like with the past year and a half that we've been in the pandemic, maybe people haven't wanted to go out and about and try thrifting. So what I really encourage people is to to look at all of the options we have for secondhand online you know, between the Depops, Poshmarks, ThreadUps, online vintage shops, Instagram vintage shops, like options are limitless. And it's it's really become quite similar to the experience as buying new clothes online. You need to know your measurements. You know, I personally look at a size chart when I order from most places online. And so I know my measurements, bust, waist, hip measurements typically. And then you, you'll you find the thing that you want. You'll see that it's in your size. You get all the item details on it. You order it to be shipped to your house and you try it on. And, you know, if you're really new to it and you haven't like quite cut out fast fashion yet, what I especially recommend is look up brands that you know you like to shop at. And especially if you're like familiar with what your sizing is in those brands. I mean, you can search like if you're a J. Crew person, you can search J. Crew and put in your sizes and you can find things that are like pretty much brand new being sold on secondhand sites. So you don't have to be like quirky or off brand or anything like that to, I mean, you know, do that if you want. Like that's my style for sure. But like you can get stuff that is like pretty much new, but you can buy it pre-loved and you'll save money doing it too. Yeah, so many great tips there. And I've totally done that with searching for specific brands or sometimes even specific products on online secondhand fashion marketplaces. Like I use Pinterest a lot for my style inspiration, Mm -hmm. but a lot of the times I'll see an aesthetic from a brand that I don't really want to support. Maybe it's a fast fashion brand. So I'll literally go to Poshmark and type in that specific product and find it for a third or even less of the original price. 
And usually these pieces are very gently used. Sometimes they're even new with tags, which is good for me as a secondhand fashion shopper, but points to some larger issues about overconsumption. But anyway, I think that this ease of shopping secondhand fashion online has definitely been a big driver of the rise in popularity of secondhand fashion. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts about what you think makes this rise in popularity exciting and maybe if there's anything that we should be aware of with this increase of interest. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's very, very exciting that secondhand is becoming more popular and that stigmas around secondhand are starting to fade away. I suppose my only caveat is that secondhand needs to become popular with the intent that we're rapidly decreasing firsthand production, like it needs to be a swap out. And unfortunately, that's not really what we're seeing so far. We are seeing more people try out secondhand, but we're still seeing firsthand production continue to grow. The biggest fast fashion brands in the world are getting even faster, producing even more, profit even, even more. So the, the positive impact of decreasing new production that's the part that like I'm not seeing yet. And and I think that needs to become part of the I mean, that's that's the reason for shifting to secondhand, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely a big topic that needs to be discussed. And another issue that people will talk about in terms of secondhand is the gentrification of thrift stores. And I know that you've talked a lot about this. And you actually wrote a really great article for Atmos that touched on this topic, and it was called Gone Vintage, How to Build a Better Thrifting System. And I will link the full article in the show notes so listeners can read the entire piece. But for those who haven't read it yet, in this article, you shed light on the perception that prices in thrift stores are going up and therefore driving the gentrification of thrift stores in some neighborhoods because of an increase in demand as thrifting becomes more popular. But as you shared in this article, there isn't exactly a shortage of supply with secondhand fashion. As you just mentioned, the purchasing of new is not declining, so we have no shortage of clothes. And in fact, countries like the U.S. are exporting and wasting enormous amounts of used clothing. So could you just dive a little bit deeper into this topic and and share your thoughts on this concern with gentrification of thrift stores? Yeah, so this is one that I get asked about a lot, and it's a really complex issue. And I think with this, like what I'm trying to get people to do is unpack the complexity of this issue because I feel like, especially online, it's just the way of online discourse. We get so tied up in trying to say like this caused this or this is the result of this or people are, people try to get me to answer like our price is going up. Is this thrift store being gentrified? Yes or no? And it's such a more complex topic than that. So bear with me, you know, if this is a long answer, but I do really think that it kind of requires this unpacking. So yeah, like you said, a lot of the discourse around the gentrification of thrift stores kind of relies on this argument of scarcity, that more thrifters coming in is driving up the price of second hand goods in the thrift store, which then prices out economically disadvantaged people in our communities who rely on thrift shops as their source of affordable clothing. But anecdotally, while people, you know, might be saying that price tags at thrift stores seem to be increasing or that the thrift stores appear to be gentrifying, most thrift store employees actually say that there's been kind of a squeeze on profit margins that doesn't really even track with inflation over the years. And that's because there's so much secondhand clothing. Like you said, there's so much used clothing on the market that on average only about 10 to 20 percent of what makes it to charity shops actually resells in those stores. And the majority of secondhand clothing that doesn't sell in U.S. charity shops or charity shops across the global north is usually exported to the global south. You know, I have collaborated with and interviewed Liz Ricketts of the Orr Foundation. Um, Their foundation does research in Accra, Ghana on Continental Market, which is the largest secondhand market in Accra. It may be one of the largest in the world to kind of talk about like that supply demand equation. And 
it really becomes clear if you look at what's going on in Accra that there's no shortage of secondhand clothing because otherwise thrift stores in the global north wouldn't be selling it on to the global south. There's so much clothing that it's constantly being cycled up and bailed out and sent sent somewhere else. And I think that the thing about this is like people have this misconception about the role that charity shops play in our society. And that has been intentionally mismarketed to people for centuries. Like it's not their fault that they think that charity shops are in our communities to serve, you know, to specifically serve folks who are economically disadvantaged. But the reality is that charity shops identified early on from their early foundation that clothing is such a fast moving, abundant consumer good that people would be readily willing to donate their old clothing for free out of eagerness to make more room in their closet to consume more newer and trendier stuff. So then the thrift stores turn around and sell those items for a profit that they use to fund whatever their charitable mission is. And sometimes that charitable mission is helping economically disadvantaged folks in our community. Sometimes it's helping an animal shelter. Sometimes it's helping with job placement. The charitable mission can really vary. But I think we have we have to understand that the way, right or wrong, you know, if we agree with this or not agree with this, like the way that charity shops function in our society is to use the clothing as an economic engine to fund their charitable work. So so that's the first thing is that like supply and demand, there's there's really not clear evidence that someone buying a t-shirt is creating a shortage for someone else because unfortunately, there is way more than anyone in the world needs to exist. And then the second thing is just kind of the, the function of charity shops in our societies. So when I talk about this, I'm not trying to say that like, Everything is great with the way that the secondhand system works or these problems aren't existing. That's not it at all. I think the thing that I wish we would talk about, like I think the thing that tires me about these continued articles about thrift store gentrification is it's become it's coming from a well-meaning place that we want the best for our communities and we want the clothing to be reused. But we're not posing constructive insteads about the issue. It's like the whole point boils down to this person should shop here or not shop here. And I thought that we were kind of coming to realize as a sustainability and activism and environmental space that it doesn't all come down to what you buy. You know, like it doesn't all come down to your metal straw or or what you buy. It comes down to like your involvement in community and your action and how you're working with the others around you to build a better, build a better ecosystem. But it it seems like the only solution that we're offering for this problem that we've identified that are, there are economically disadvantaged folks living in our communities and there's way too much clothing is like certain people shouldn't be thrifting. And I just, it seems incomplete to me. I don't think that removing thrifters from that equation actually solves those problems that we're passionate about. And so in my article, I try to offer some ideas about how an increasing thrifting populace can actually like come together with the community to try to think of some cooperative solutions that would make our secondhand space improved. And the suggestions that I offer in my article are like by no means exhaustive. I think this this is why I'm like, we need to be getting together in conversation. Folks need to be talking about this, like how are we improving the secondhand clothing system? That's where it actually gets interesting. Like volunteering, for example, charity shops, part of the reason why they're not reselling quite so much is because a lot of the charity shop processes is like a manual sorting process. There's a lot of labor involved with that process. You know, could spending your time in the charity shop actually help less clothing be sent to landfill? Could it help the charity shop resell more within your local community? Could it help them provide better services to your local community? I've heard of amazing programs where thrifters who, you know, source from a charity shop or are visiting a charity shop often, they will offer to curate a designated career closet. So charity shops often can get sponsorships for things like career closets for folks who need to have affordable work-appropriate clothing. 
And so then these thrifters who like use the charity shop as the place where they source, they'll come in and they'll do that like curation and that picking for the charity shop so then they can have their free career closet. The Orr Foundation, who I mentioned in Accra, Ghana, they, um, you know, they've identified the same kind of thing in Accra that a lot of younger people will go to Contamanto Market, the big secondhand market there. And because they, you know, they have a phone and they know how to use Instagram, they can often resell a piece for more than what the person working in the market could make. And while that's a good thing because it does like contribute to what we want to see happen, that clothing not going to landfill. It's also a good thing if those folks could share those skills so that, you know, we're creating more equity among the community and we're achieving our shared goal of keeping more clothing from landfill. Ultimately, about 40% of what flows through Contamanto Market ends up in landfill. So again, there is no scarcity. Uh, there is there is way more than we need. So, you know, if they're tech savvy and younger, um, could they help the folks who have had a stall in Contamanto Market for 30 years work on that online presence, for example? That's a partnership that they're trying to establish there. You know, other things could be like, could you offer your services as a mender? Could you offer workshops that show people in your community how to keep their clothing for longer so they're not donating things that are in really bad condition to the charity shop, which is contributing to the charity shop's decline? There are so many ways that we can look at this problem of, I want to provide mutual aid that helps my community and I want to prevent clothing from going landfill. There's so many ways that we can address that problem, and it shouldn't necessarily be boiled down to this person should or shouldn't shop at a thrift shop. This is something that I can talk about for days, but I just think that rather than putting these boxes or trying to establish the system of blame, we all benefit more if the entire secondhand ecosystem, all the folks who participate in secondhand and benefit from it, come together and dig deeper and discuss systemic solutions that work for all parties. Um, and I think that's how we start to build a better shared secondhand space that addresses all these things that, that we need it to address. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for diving into all of that. That was very educational and I think, you know, perspective shifting as well. But it makes sense, you know, just like we can't create a better firsthand fashion economy just by what we do or don't buy, it won't be enough to create a more equitable, just secondhand fashion economy just by focusing on where or how much secondhand fashion we consume individually. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, there's... We've learned this lesson once around. So, you know, we need to put it to practice again as we're like shifting to second hand and building up that system. We need to we need to talk to our charity shops if they're not prioritizing sustainability in the way that we wish their mission did. We need to like work together on some of these system building things. There's so much more than just like what is bought. Mhm. Mm totally. So you did touch on this before, but do you have any other tips or pieces of advice that you would share with people who want to get involved with secondhand fashion activism? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think just like talking to the other folks who are part of your secondhand ecosystem locally, like getting engaged with that local community. Like I mentioned, I feel like people don't quite realize how much of the secondhand industry is still done by hand, all the sorting, the circulating, the curating, even the physical carrying of materials within the sec or within the global secondhand market is done by hand and it requires a lot of labor to to attempt to recirculate all of this excess clothing. And so I think people who are passionate about this should consider volunteering, consider programming you know, just partnering in whatever way you can to to make your community a better place and to do your part in making sure that clothing's recirculated. Absolutely. So something that I've been thinking a lot about lately in terms of ethics in the secondhand fashion space is the role of bigger companies or corporations in secondhand fashion. And a recent event that 
people may have heard about is that the large secondhand fashion retailer ThreadUp, who I believe markets themselves as the largest online secondhand fashion retailer, recently went public at a $1.3 billion valuation and is now being traded on the stock market. And I would love to get your thoughts on what this might mean for the future of secondhand fashion. Yeah, this is a super interesting development for the world of secondhand. So if you're not familiar with ThreadUp, basically the ThreadUp model is kind of like a, you can either sell your stuff or donate your stuff to ThreadUp. So it's not peer-to-peer like a Poshmark or a Depop where you list stuff on your page and then like I'd sell it directly to Elizabeth. You're selling it to ThreadUp and then they're dealing with it. That's always been their model. But in recent years, what has been really interesting to see ThreadUp do is they've started to get into the space of helping retail brands, firsthand retail brands, start their secondhand arm. And I think that they've realized that that's the way they can truly scale their work at ThreadUp. I think of ThreadUp really as becoming more of a tech company than a resale company in some ways. Their product is actually like that platform that helps clothing that like passes through thread up, but then also helps other firsthand brands like recirculate their clothing. So they've started partnering with tons. I mean, I, I believe ThreadUp heads up the secondhand operations at Gap, Madewell, Reformation, Walmart, possibly Levi's. I think, yeah, it looks like there are 21 different retail partners that ThreadUp currently has. And I think that that's the direction that they're headed. I think that that valuation shows that, that like they're planning to expand their tech in that way. Now, I've pointed out this contradiction before. The Orr Foundation, again, that's doing research in Accra, Ghana, they remind us that, you know, while ThreadUp and other Global North resellers like them get a lot of funding for this mission of recirculating clothing, they're not really the ones who are doing the most of it. ThreadUp's 2020 resale report says that they've recirculated 100 million items total since ThreadUp began in 2009, so that's, what, 11 years? But by comparison, Contamanto recirculates 100 million items, that same amount, in just four months. So that scale is mind-blowing to think about. And when you add on top of it that most of the clothing that ends up in Contamanto market is considered low-grade. It's the stuff from the global north, you know, that couldn't be resold. The stuff that resale platforms like a thread up couldn't resell. The stuff that charity shops like a Goodwill couldn't resell. And so then it comes to Contamanto where still like we focus a lot on the 40% that heads to landfill, but it's an astonishing amount of clothing that is recirculated. The unfortunate thing is that there's nowhere else for the unsold to go. And so what is unbalanced in that equation is that Contamanto doesn't receive those millions, billions of dollars of investments that platforms like ThreadUp receive, even though they're really doing the most in in terms of circularity. As with anything on my platform, you know, it's the same thing as when I'm talking about the conversation of thrift store gentrification. I don't have these conversations to say like X platform is bad or this, you know, this one group of people or this one company is causing this problem. It's really more about understanding the complexity of these topics and, you know, it's about understanding that we should be asking the question, what could a market like Contamanto do if it had the kind of investment into circularity that ThreadUp sees? Same thing with thinking about this idea that where I predict ThreadUp is heading is into helping firsthand retail brands get into the secondhand space. I don't think that that's bad. I don't think it's bad that firsthand retail brands want to do secondhand, but I do think that they're getting into it because it's an additional stream of profit. I think they're getting into it because they recognize that secondhand is the arm of the fashion market that's growing the fastest, that it's projected to outpace firsthand clothing. And so these brands are not going to lose out. They're going to they're going to chase that additional stream of profit. And the issue with that is it comes back to what we talked about at the beginning, right? Like secondhand is supposed to help us decrease new production. 
And so if these fashion brands are just like adding that as an additional stream of revenue and not adding it so that they can intentionally and rapidly decrease what they are creating, supplying, and selling new, then it's missing the point. But yeah, I mean, that if you ask me, that's definitely the direction that it looks like ThreadUp is heading. And I think it's inevitable that we will see lots and lots of fashion brands looking for their piece of the secondhand pie in years to come. Definitely. And I'm just curious, have you seen any models or any ways that we can kind of ensure that as these fashion retailers get into the secondhand market, what ways can we ensure that they're also decreasing their production of new? Is there anything, are there any movements that are like working towards that? Or have you seen anything about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting. I get so tied up about what I think about these initiatives, right? Because like, of course, if they offer a secondhand option, like I'm going to pick that because I want the thing that's already been created. I don't want to buy the thing that's new. So I'm like, how do I feel about buying from one of their secondhand initiatives? And it's complicated. And I think people will land on a different side of that all the time. I mean, I think it's continuing to apply pressure on the brands saying, I'm a passionate secondhand shopper and I think it's great that you're getting into the secondhand space. You know, brands will 100% present their getting into the secondhand space as being like a signifier of their morality. They'll be like, we are so eco-conscious. We're getting into the secondhand space. And I'm not saying it's not true. Like it is eco-conscious, but I think the, the thing to flip back at them is, that's wonderful. What are you doing to decrease your new production? Because I think that part's clearly missing. From what I have seen, that part is not part of the mission. I think that it's just wanting to profit off both. You know, brands want to continue to produce new, but then they also want to profit off of secondhand. You know, especially if you think about money shifting to secondhand, they're going where the money's going. Right. But yeah, I mean, could they use it as a strategy for intentional degrowth, which is what we know that the industry needs? Right. And there maybe are some brands like Eileen Fisher. I know that's definitely something that they're genuinely yeah. doing take back programs, resale programs, because they do want to find a way to you know make enough money, keep their employees employed without this constant increase in production. So I think that with some brands, you can tell what their intentions are. And yep, that's definitely, definitely a key point to watch out for. Patagonia is another one. Yes. I emailed or I interviewed Patagonia Warnware on my show, and you can hear them talk about that, that that's in their ethos, that it's always been about not overproducing. And so it only makes sense that secondhand would be something that they've long prioritized. Right. I think we can see through which brands are trying to present themselves in a certain way and which brands are actually like trying to make a significant impact because I think it would make a significant impact for a brand to come out and say like we are investing in this shift to second hand and that's going to allow us to decrease what we're producing new and all the raw resources and carbon emissions that come from producing new. Like that's transformative. So it'll be interesting to see uh, as more of that happens, what that looks like. Yeah. And I really hope to see that and hope that other companies follow the lead of Patagonia and Eileen Fisher and companies like that who are really genuinely involving themselves in these sorts of models to reduce the production of new. For now, though, going back to what listeners can do right now, for people who do want to shop pre-loved fashion and do so in a conscious way, what are your tips for thoughtfully shopping secondhand fashion? Okay. So it all comes back to don't buy more than you need. So start to get real about what you need in your closet, what you like, Keep a thrift list so you know what you're looking for and you don't get swept up with the excitement that we've all experienced of like we walk into a secondhand store and we just find a gem of a piece. And even though it's something that we don't need, we think, oh, this is too good to pass up. That's just a practice that, you know, we continuously have to get better at. And I think I think a great way for people to break their buying habit is to do like a no buy. So 
at Remake, which is an ethical fashion advocacy organization. We are about to start this summer our No New Clothes Pledge. So it's a three-month pledge about not buying new clothes. You can interpret that how you will. You can interpret that as just no newly produced clothes or you can try to not buy anything for three months. But taking some sort of like hard and fast like step back quitting fashion consumption can really help to reset your mindset. They say it takes about 90 days to reset a habit. So something like that I think can really help you to reset. I think also, too, it's important for folks to understand that we should be donating mindfully. We should think of our clothes as a gift. We should think of our clothes as something that we love or, you know, if we pass it on, it's because we're hoping that our friend or our neighbor might love it, too. We should think of our clothing as being something that someone made by hand because people make all of our clothing by hand. So yeah, just kind of changing our mindset around the things that are in our closets and remembering that, yeah, they're things to be cherished and loved. Yes, I definitely was buying more secondhand fashion than I needed when I first got into it. I (laughs) bought clothes just because I was like, oh, well, that's a great brand for such an amazing price. And then I got it and I was like, this is actually not my style. I won't wear this. So We all do it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So shifting gears a little bit here, you recently joined the team at the nonprofit Remake as their advocacy manager. Could you tell us a little bit about your role there and how you and Remake are engaging people to make fashion a force for good? Yeah. So Remake is a global nonprofit that works on kind of three main pillars. So they have educational work. So they will produce documentaries, lectures on fashion issues. They will do advocacy work, which is, you know, campaigning for living wages or gender justice, that kind of systemic change at a policy level like we've talked about. And they also do transparency work. So they rate fashion brands and they work with fashion brands about how to get better about their sustainability practices really throughout their whole supply chain. So Remake is powered by this global ambassador network. So there are all of these awesome ambassadors. Um, I know you yourself are a Remake ambassador as well. You know, folks who love fashion and want it to be better who power this movement. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to join the team as Remake's advocacy manager. So I will basically be helping ambassadors, that big ambassador network, kind of understand the advocacy work, the policy issues. So Remake is, you know, for example, partnering with the Garment Worker Center in Los Angeles to fight for SB 62, the Garment Worker Protection Act, which is a policy that would eliminate the piece rate pay in California. So that's a policy issue that we are fighting for to have changed in the California State Senate. And I will kind of engage with the ambassador community to make sure, you know, that the policy is easy to understand, that people can communicate about it easily, that you can tell your mom, your sister, your cousin about why these issues matter. So I'll do that for Remake's campaigns. So SB62, folks might be familiar with the Pay Up campaign, which started at the beginning of the pandemic when fashion brands started backing out of factories without paying for orders that were already in production. And um, the Pay Up Coalition came together to unlock $22 billion of owed wages for garment workers. And that that work is ongoing. And then the other one, which we mentioned, um, no new clothes. So kind of campaigning to get folks to understand why we need to decrease consumption and decrease production. And so no new clothes is coming up this summer. And I'm really excited about that. You know, it's They're all causes that I really believe in, but like I keep saying, I think that we have so much more work to do on producing less and that's going to, that's going to really be what revolutionizes the fashion industry. Yeah, Remake is really doing so many incredible things. So yeah, as you mentioned, I am an ambassador as well and really love being part of this organization. So I will put the links to everything you mentioned in the show notes so that people can check that all out. 
To close out this interview, I have one final question that I ask all guests that come onto this show, and that is, what does a better future for fashion look like to you? Yeah, I would say a world with a lot less stuff, being able to be happy with less, with less things, maybe more abundance, more time with our families, better pay, you know, more in some categories of our lives, but less in terms of physical objects. And I hope that we can learn to find joy in reusing the stuff that exists and I think that that will bring about a better future for fashion and for our planet and all the people living here. And that's a wrap for this episode. Be sure to take a look at the episode description in your podcast app for the links referenced in this episode, as well as the various links to learn more about today's guest. For the full transcript of this episode, you can head on over to ConsciousLifeAndStyle.com and navigate to the podcast section of the site. The link to the full show notes should also be linked in whatever podcast app that you are listening on. If you would like to spread the word about this show and help the content reach more people, you can share the episode or podcast with a friend, screenshot this episode and share about it on Instagram stories, tagging at Conscious Style. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, something that really helps is to leave a rating and review. Thank you in advance for supporting the show in whatever way that you can. For more conscious content, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Conscious Edit. In this newsletter, I share recommendations for reading, listening to, watching, and much more. To get on that list, you can head to ConsciousLifeInStyle.com forward slash edit. And a link to subscribe will also be in the episode description. Thank you for tuning in to the Conscious Style Podcast and sticking around until the very end. I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week.